before they're distributed, as in the form of a prior restraint, then the government has a heavy burden to justify the grounds of those seizures, that seizure. The government is obligated to get a prompt review of what they've done, to in initiate a prompt review by a court, and get a quick decision straight away on whether the seizure was proper. So if they come in and take your stuff, or they take your uh, movie that you were going to show at the theater, that sort of thing, they have to initiate right away court review of what they've done. Also, if the government uses search warrants uh, to search for obscene materials, these have to be, of course, judicially approved, and they have to specifically describe the materials to be seized. Broad warrants uh, have been struck down because they leave too much discretion to the seizing authorities. They would get, you know, to go out and look at all of your books and materials without any sense of what they're looking for. That sort of thing is unacceptable. The other way we protect even obscene materials is a kind of privacy protection. And it's a rule that comes out of the case of Stanley versus Georgia. An adult person has the right to possess and enjoy obscenity if that person can get it home. But it's only a right to enjoy obscenity in the home. It's not a right to buy it. It's not a right to sell it. It's not a right to order it. It's just, if you manage to get it into your home, enjoy it. It's also not a right to use child pornography at home. Even if you get your obscenity home and would otherwise be protected under Stanley versus Georgia, it won't be a protection to you if, in fact, the obscenity that you're enjoying was made with children. Because in this case, we're really concerned about children, we're concerned about minors, and we want to dry up the market for the use of children in obscenity. And so we're going to make an exception to the rule that you can enjoy it at home if you're enjoying children, if that's what titillates you, that we can get. So these are very modest protections for even obscene materials, procedural protections as I've described, and this limited privacy protection if you get it home. There's another side to this too though. As I said, even obscene materials get a little bit of protection of some kind, but the other side is that even materials that are not obscene, not obscene, merely sexually explicit, can be subject to some controls in a few circumstances, the court has said. First, again, the government has this substantial interest in the protection of minors, so it may limit the availability of even only sexually explicit, non-obscene materials to minors. And again, it may prohibit the use of minors in creating such materials. That's fairly unquestioned, and the court has unanimously reacted in favor of permitting the government to regulate whether attempting to protect minors even from sexually explicit materials doesn't matter that they're not obscene. Another way the government has been given greater protection, I mean greater regulation authority over materials that are not obscene but only sexually explicit is through the zoning power. The court has said, for example, that governments can use their zoning power to prescribe where places of so-called adult entertainment may operate. And in this regard, the court has identified something that it calls the secondary effects doctrine. It said that although it looks like this is a kind of content control of speech that's not within the category of obscenity, what it really is, is control of the secondary effects, the byproducts that generally accompany these adult entertainment activities prostitution, vice, degradation of the neighborhood, reduction of property values. It's almost like if you've ever seen that cartoon Peanuts, there's this character Pigpen, and Pigpen, a little kid, and even right after a shower, what he always has is like a cloud of dust and smut and junk around him. Well, the court said that these adult entertainment business activities have those pieces of dust and smut around them, the secondary effects that always goes with them, and the government can control these adult entertainment uh, businesses because it's really controlling the secondary effects. And so, for example, the court has said that you can use your zoning fa power to prescribe that these businesses cluster in red light districts. You can concentrate them because you want to put them all in one area and, and control them. Sometimes I think of this as erogenous zoning. Now, a fourth category, we've looked at incitement, 
fighting words and obscenity, a fourth category is libel and defamation. Now, when you libel or defame, defame somebody, you're saying something untrue about them. And you might say to yourself, well, gee, isn't that tort law and isn't that okay? What does that have to do with the Constitution? Well, for a long time, libel and defamation had nothing to do with the Constitution. The Constitution imposed no limit on the actions one could bring for libel and slander until the 1960s. The court started to realize then, and finally gave expression to its realization, that, gee, if we have unrestricted opportunities for people to sue whenever somebody else has said something untrue about them, that could have a powerful dampening effect on public debate. For example, let's say I go to a public meeting and there's Councilwoman Snodgrass. I complain about her. I say she's a thief. Or maybe there's Governor Snorkel. And I call him a bum and, and uh, corrupt. And you know, whatever other highly intelligent observations I might want to make, I might pause a lot and think about what I'm going to say because I might worry that if what I said was factually untrue, I could be sued. And if I could be su subject to suit at the drop of a hat, that really might trim my sails and it might make me worry about what I'm going to say. And I might not go and say anything because I think it was Learned Hand, Judge Learned Hand, who said, next to sickness and, and, and taxes or dying, the worst thing that can happen to you is that you're sued. But the point is that people might start to self-censor because they're worried about lawsuits. So the court, sensing this chill, this potential chill on public debate, fashioned special rules beginning in the 1960s to govern libel and slander, particularly when they involved public officials or public figures. And what the court said was this, we want to make sure that public debate on public issues is wide open, uninhibited, and robust. Therefore, we're not going to end the opportunity for public officials and public fi figures to sue for defamation, but we're going to limit it in a way to accommodate our concern about freedom of speech on public matters. And what the court decided was this. If a person is a public official, they're running for office, they're elected to office, they're, they hold a high position in the government, or if they're a public figure, and we'll talk about two different kinds of public figures in a minute, in order for them to recover damages in libel and slander, they have to show by clear and convincing evidence that there was a false statement and that it was made by the person, either knowing that it was false or with reckless disregard of whether it was false or not. In other words, made with actual malice. Now, the court has also said that there are limits on libel and slander suits by private persons, too, a modest limit. They can, of course, sue in libel and defamation, and they can sue under any theory except strict liability. They could sue under mere negligence, but it has to be something. So this was to accommodate our need for public debate. And the big question is, who's a public official and who's a public figure as opposed to who's a private figure? Because you have these different rules. Now, public officials elected to office, candidates for office, important leaders in the government, there are two kinds of public figures. You can have what we call an all-purpose public figure, someone who has gained such pervasive fame and notoriety that, in effect, they've become a household name. They voluntarily injected themselves into the limelight. They can command the attention of the media. They can hold press conferences and people will come. They're public figures for all purposes. Movie stars, famous athletes typically fall into this category. Dan Rather would be a public figure. Michael Jordan, Madonna. Then there are limited purpose public figures. Somebody who's involved in a particular